Well, good morning. It is really great to be with you. Uh, there's something going on in this place. Uh, I've never been greeted more times than I ever was greeted here. Um, I don't know if it's this room. I don't know if it's how well you all sing or if it's Kyle's wonderful leadership or the songs we had that you liked, but it just, there's a spirit in this place and it's my privilege to be with you today. How many of you know when I would use the phrase Good Samaritan what I'm talking about? Yeah, pretty much the house, right? We know what a Good Samaritan is. You're on the highway and you get a flat tire and you realize that the tire iron, the lug nut remover or loosener is in the other car. What are you going to do? You're going to pray for a Good Samaritan to come and who has such a thing who not only loosens the lug nuts, but helps you change the tire and put you back on the road in 15 minutes. Well, I wonder if we could learn even more about that Good Samaritan kind of thing from the great master teacher this morning. So I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 25. We're going to probe that story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan this morning very familiar for maybe to many of you, but we'll begin by reading from verse 25 of Luke 10 to 37. While you're turning to that, it's reminding you that Jesus begins, or the Luke begins chapter 10, rather, with Jesus sending out the 72 to places that he wanted to go. And he has some weird instructions. He has some instructions about not taking a bag, not having a suitcase, not carrying a purse, all those kinds of things. But he twice in that section tells them whether a town receives them or whether a town rejects them. Their message is to say the kingdom of God is near you. And then we get to verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So we just read Luke's account of a conversation between Jesus and a teacher of the law. Not a lawyer like we think of lawyers today, but someone who went the second mile in understanding Jewish Deuteronomic law. And the lawyer asks, what must I do to be saved? Now Jesus realizes this guy's a smart guy, so he... He answers his question with a question. What does the law say? 
Mr. Expert of the Law. And the guy thinks, man, this is like playing softball and having the ball just kind of thrown right into your sweet spot. So he takes a swing at it. And he, he nails it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Out of all those Levitical Deuteronomical laws, he comes up with the summary to love God and love your neighbor. Jesus says, you nailed that one. Good answer. Now do that, and you're set. Now the lawyer, I imagine, gets a funny look on his face at this point, and he, he set back a little, because Jesus didn't say, know that, and you'll be good. He didn't say, answer that way, or use those words, say that, and you'll be good. He challenges him to do it. So, that prompts another question in this smart guy's mind, and that is to say, well, who counts as a neighbor? Who's my neighbor? In other words, who has a claim on me? Who does God expect me to love? Who's mandatory? You know, people like parents, husbands, wives, kids. Who's extra credit? Where do I get bonus points for loving that one? So Jesus stops and tells a story. A story that this morning I want you to think about as one that challenges not only this guy but us to develop a heart for the world, to develop a heart of compassion for others. So whoever this guy was, going from Jerusalem to Jericho, which apparently was a dangerous road. I'd never ridden on it. I'd never been there. But I'm told that it was a place where thieves and robbers routinely hid out. And this poor guy falls into their hands. And they beat him. And they rob him. And they leave him as... My version puts it half dead. I don't know what half dead looks like. More dead than not, I guess. But really beat up. And unless he gets some help, the other half of death might be his lot. So, as Jesus tells the story, those listening and recording this hear him say that there's a priest coming on that road and they think oh good a rescue someone who would you would think really want to care but this leader doesn't stop matter of fact he does everything in his power this priest to get on the opposite side of the road some say that he did that because he was in a hurry and had a meeting and you know just didn't have time to be a good Samaritan Others say that if a priest actually stopped and helped the man, he'd get blood on his hands because the guy was kind of, you know, him, he's bleeding, he's, he's hurt. And then he would be, have to go through all kinds of ritual washings and cleansings before he could serve in his job as priest again. So it's kind of inconvenient. So he passes by on the other side. We don't know why people are speculating what, with those things that I said. Those are what commentators are good for. Second person comes by, and this time it's a Levite. Not quite high on the pecking order, religious, spirituality-wise, as the priest, but kind of just the next notch lower. So again, if you're listening to this story for the first time, you're thinking, okay, strike one, but we've got this guy, this Levite, he'll help. And he passes by on the other side. And then Jesus blows the story wide open. 
when he says that a third person comes by and he's a Samaritan. Now, if you know anything about Jews and Samaritans, you know that they really didn't have a whole lot of love for each other. Jews considered Samaritans sort of like we in the 1800s when we were wanting to conquer the West, thought of the Indians, of the Native Americans. We thought of them as less than human. And the Samaritans were thought of that way. And the shocking, surprising teaching of Jesus is, it's the Samaritan of all people, the half-wit, if you will, who stops to help. It's kind of hard to find a 20th century equivalent for a Samaritan. But we have so, you understand what a good Samaritan is when I say it, because we have so sanctified that term by anybody who does good to another. Back in the 90s, if I preached this sermon after 9-11, or back around 2001 when 9-11 hit, the equivalent might have been an Islamic terrorist. In some cultures, in some sections of society, it would be, you know, a Trump supporter or a, a, a uh, Democrat. In our world, we're divided like that. In other places, it would be, say, a person of another faith person of another ethnicity, someone different than me, that I have a hard time relating to. In any case, Jesus uses the Samaritan, a subhuman, a despised, an unclean person, which the people Jesus is speaking to would have nothing to do with. But this good Samaritan, Jesus teaches, does at least three things that are instructive for us when it comes to developing a heart for the world. And the first thing is, is he comes near. Verse 33 says it simply, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came by, came to where the man was. He came. To, near to him. He didn't cross on the other side of the road. He came there. And the first part of developing our hearts for the world is proximity. It's getting close enough to care, to love, to be of help. We have to admit that we live in a world that separates rather than comes close whether it's rich or poor or sick or well or black or white or young or old, those are the, the polarities we try to manage. And obviously coming near doesn't do anything for the guy laying there bleeding in the side of the road. You're not ready to help yet. You haven't developed the full heart yet. But it might be that as he came, he started looking at him and wondered if he had broken bones and one, you know, just started investigating and, and looking over what, what's going to be required to, to help this guy. And he comes up with some solutions. He puts uh, some oil and wine on his wounds and, and he tries with whatever he's got with him to bandage those wounds and he uses his own donkey to bring him to an inn. And in it all, he learned about how to help somebody who is half dead on the road. So if, if he comes near and investigates and experiments and helps, maybe we're not ready to help yet, but we can learn. We can come near by becoming a student about those various things. We can go on serve projects and, 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 and some level, you went there to help. You wanted to build something or paint something or whatever the serve project involved. But what ended up happening for most people who do that 
you want to help that person you want to be that good Samaritan but it ends up helping you much more you learn about poverty you learn about differences you learn about happiness in the midst of nothing the daughter that's a friend of of need was once been sent for a month to Mexico. She went to Mexico and she said when she got back, the people have nothing and they are happy. And she went in her closet and she took a half of her wardrobe and gave it away, realizing that she didn't need all that. She started to come near to something she'd never experienced before and it changed her attitude and her life. If we would worship with other traditions, what would that look like? To learn about other, even Christian styles, things that we just don't know. What, what is it like to worship with Hispanics? What's it like to worship with with a black church. There'd be a lot more body movement in each of those worlds than ours. You could sing with them, and you can't move like them. <laughs> a year ago, about this time, my wife and I were invited to go to Oman and Egypt because those are Muslim cultures. Those are the predominant cultures. And we were going there basically to be in a place where we were not the dominant culture. It's downright scary, I have to tell you, at times. We were kept safe. It wasn't that. But you can't speak the language. We went into a restaurant, six of us, and we, we were just simply trying to order a, some sort of chicken. And he didn't understand what we were saying. And if you don't understand what the, you're saying to each other, it's really unnerving. And it's also really hard because you know that if they bring out the chicken and it's been boiled in the water that, that it gets boiled in, you're going to get really sick. Because there are three rules in, in Egypt when you eat. If it's not something you can peel or boil or in a plastic container, you know, like a bottle of water. You don't touch it. So we made a beeline out of that restaurant when we started realizing that we're all going to get killed or sick or, you know, just have a, a very, very bad experience. We could not communicate. But the lessons learned from that are like coming near and looking at this bleeding body on the side of a road Another way to come near is if you want to learn about homelessness, for example, you can read a book. If you want to read about multiculturalism, you can read some books about that. If you want to read about diversity, there's oodles of stuff on Amazon that if you just start looking. And we have to overcome some things when you come near. You have to overcome your arrogance. You have to overcome your prejudice. You have to overcome your pride, your greed, or your fear to come near someone else. Part of this means making space. And some of us, we're like Legos that are so already full, we don't have any open slots for anyone to fit on between our families and our friends. That person doesn't fit in. But that isn't what really strikes me about this story. The second thing that this guy does is even more powerful. He has compassion on him. As he came alongside him, when he saw him, the verse tells us he took pity on him. Now, that doesn't mean pity like, oh, oh you poor thing. It was pity as in compassion. 
From the center of his being, he identified with this man, and it broke down the wall between a Jew and a Samaritan that they are brothers, that they are sisters. A number and number of years ago now, there was this Rwandan crisis that dominated the news, and it's been quieted down for quite a while, but out of that African country came a story or two that I share with you. This one comes out of a book called Out of Africa. And, you know, they get monsoon rains. And after the monsoon rain, a very, very long earthworm was crawling across the jungle floor. And he saw what took to be, he took to be, another earthworm. And he said, wow, you are the most beautiful earthworm I have ever, ever seen. Will you marry me? And the answer came back, don't be stupid, I'm your other end. <laughs> There's a lesson in that story. We could turn to each other if you were my church. And since I don't know you well enough, I don't dare do this. I would have you turn to each other and shake each other's hand, and I would have you say to each other, I'm your other end. Because we've all been made by the same God. We've all been given the gift of life and mercy and love in him. We are all in this together. Tell me, where is the human being that God didn't love enough to send his only son, Jesus, into the world to save? And when we belong to God, and I think you know this quite well in this church, by the way that you greet each other and love each other and hug each other, you become brothers and sisters in Christ. You become family. You become friends. The Rwanda tragedy story that I referenced before was a sad one. I love to say the names of the two tribes that were warring at the time, Hutu and Tutsi. Not Tutsi rolls, just T-U-T-S-I. They hated each other. And the animosity between tribes caused over a half a million, 650,000 and more to, to die in the conflict over 25 years. But there was a church in Rwanda that was comprised of both. It broke the pattern. It, it broke the, the paradigm that we should hate each other and kill each other until we exterminate one of those or the other of the tribes, depending on who would win. This church was comprised of both. And they were worshiping on a Sunday morning, just like we are, only in Africa. And the militia came along. And they ordered one of the tribes to go outside and the other tribe to stay inside. If you were part of one tribe leave the building. If you were a part of the other tribe, stay inside the building. And everybody knew what that meant. Because all outside would be saved and all of those left inside would be killed, exterminated. Now imagine if that were this room and somebody with a gun came and said, all of you 30 and younger can get out. I'm a dead man in that case, obviously. And all of you, part of you can stay. And if, and if you think about that, and everybody's leaving, and, and, we're, and there's tears, and we're, you're upset. But well, here's what happened in the church that day. They all went to the middle of the room, and none of them were left. I mean, none of them left the room. They said, we're in this together. We're not going to separate. For we are brothers and sisters. We will not go. So they stayed together. And in a matter of minutes, the militia slaughtered 500 of them. And yet, as sad as that story is to relate, 
There was a power greater than bullets and guns and death that day, wasn't there? Now the day is coming. We sang about it not that long ago with, with the, how great thou art, the last verse. The day is coming when that kind of power, the power of love, the power of identification, to come near and to have a heart of compassion, when that power is going to overcome this world. The Bible calls it the reclaiming power of God. And there are times when I think, pat myself on the back a little bit and think, you know, I have a heart for the world. I'm trying to share it right now with you. And I say that because I don't want a, to put a bullet in somebody. Never been my desire. But there's a deeper question here that the story brings out, and that is this. Who am I willing to take a bullet for? And that stops me in my tracks, as I'm sure it would you. I don't think it's right for us to exterminate anybody based on what we think about them, but I, I'm not so sure that I'm ready to give my life for that person. Should push come to shove. Most of us would have to agree that we are so far from that sort of heroic actions. We start at a much humbler place. We start by coming near and we start by understanding what's the situation and we understand each other, but it also moves then to a place where we have a heart of pity, a heart of compassion, a heart of love. And we have to confess our apathy, perhaps, or we have to confess our prejudices, perhaps, or we have to confess our own fears, most likely, that prevent us. Maybe as you drive in the city, notice where some people live. And reflect just on those who in their lives are facing grinding poverty where bus fare is hard to come by no less rent and food or when you're driving reflect on what it might be like to not even have the ability to have a car or if you give blood I can't do that because I always faint I don't know what it is sight of needles I think but if you did give blood, think of those who are chronically ill. Think of those who are in constant pain. And like that other end of the earthworm, say, I'm your other end. So he comes near. He cares and he has compassion. But the third thing he does is he offers help. He gives that first aid treatment. He gets him on this donkey, takes him to the inn, gives instructions to help him recover. Now, I want you to notice he doesn't do everything. He doesn't give all kinds of money. He, doesn't, he probably had more than two denarii on him. But he does do something. He doesn't do brain surgery or, you know, uh, arm separated shoulder surgery, whatever this guy might have needed. He doesn't start a mugged ministry. He doesn't cancel his business trip. He does what he can. Which is important for us to realize because when we start facing the, with compassion the needs of the world, they can come and be overwhelming. But don't do everything. This guy teaches us, the Samaritan. But do something. Imagine for a moment that you could walk into some big storehouse or restaurant and you would see all the food that you're going to eat in your lifetime. Now, some of you eat like birds, so it wouldn't be too bad a deal for you, but others of us, our us carnivores, could be a little daunting to see that. Stacks of vegetables, mounds of meat, Forklift loads of Fritos, Twinkies, Ho-Hos, chips, dip, guac, 
and chips. And you look at all that and you say, I might as well give up. There's no way on God's green earth you can eat all that. But the secret is this. You're going to do that one bite at a time. And it's staggering what you and I can eat when you think about it one bite at a time. And thinking of something like world hunger, people die one at a time. And people are saved one at a time. And so you can take a next step when it comes to having a heart for the world. You can, you can join Compassion or World Vision and sponsor water for, for, for uh, places that don't have it, wells to be dug. Sponsor a child with Compassion for less than the cost of a Starbucks coffee a week. You can visit a nursing home, kind of our now marginalized population. You can get involved with a food pantry. You can write to prisoners. You can visit prisoners. You can tutor a child. You can mentor a teen. You can have significance. Because the world needs you. Somebody needs you. One on one needs you. The story in New York City was that there was this little homeless girl named Kathy who came to the shelter carrying a paint can. And she went everywhere with the paint can. And if anybody tried to touch that paint can, they'd say, I'm sorry, this is mine. Everybody asked her, what's in it? It's only for me. And if she was hurt or sad or angry, she'd rock gently and she'd hold that can close to her chest and just rock with it. One of the staff broke through to the Kathy and said, she whispers to her, Kathy, that's a really nice can. What's in it? And Kathy, with tears, says, it's my mother. She said, it's her ashes. I went and got them from the funeral home. And then they noticed the date of birth, the date of death, and the name of the mother who had given her up because she was a drug addict. Two days after she was born, this little girl, Kathy, A little girl with a paint can. I just came back from Colorado, and I'll tell you then, we live in a world of unimaginable beauty and unimaginable joy, and a lot of us have way more than our fair share of all of that. But we also live in a world of unbelievable pain and despair and hurt. And somebody needs for you to be the Good Samaritan, to, to love, to come near, to put into practice what Jesus says to this lawyer. Somebody's on the roads you travel on, and they're laying there on the side. Are you going to cross on the other side because you're too busy? So I want you to bring to mind maybe somebody that you know right now that Oh, they're not bleeding and they're not half dead, but somebody who needs somebody. You're her other end. You're his other end. I love thinking creatively about the postscript. You know, the guy says that when he returns, I'll reimburse you for any ex extra expense you have. So he comes back, this business traveler, this Samaritan. And the guy does recover at the inn. And as he recovers, he's so grateful for life and for the fact that someone cared for him that he's going to have a party for all his friends in the dining area of the inn. And they're going to celebrate the fact that he's well again. And if one of those priests or Levites happens to walk by and hears the commotion of the party, imagine his chagrin, knowing how he handled it. 
at the end of life. We don't want to be that person, knowing that you've just passed by. And we might have a nice life, and we might have a nice car, and we might have a nice house. But then, what have we got? Brothers and sisters lying on the side of the road. So somebody else comes to the lobby, pulls out his wallet and says, what do I owe you for the expenses for that guy I brought in here? It's that good Samaritan. And the desk clerk has explicit instructions to take him to the party. And the man whose life was saved, everything stops in the party room and he throws his arms around that guy and they weep and they tell all his friends, this is the man who saved my life. The end of our one and only life. That's the person I'd like to be, wouldn't you? Jesus tells the story, who is my neighbor? And the lawyer, he knows the answer, the one who showed mercy. We have a God who has, we, as we sang about it early on, a God who gives us the, <laughs> the most merciful treatment beyond what we deserve, grace. And then Jesus says, well, Mr. Lawyer, go and do likewise. That guy's been dead for a couple thousand years now. This is our chance. What will you do and who will you be neighbor to? Let's pray. God, it's always been the story of this world. Beauty and joy, hurt and pain. And we foolishly think sometimes that bypassing pain, bypassing hurt in the road is the road to take. But the road that the Good Samaritan took is the road to take. He came near, he cared, he had compassion, and he offered the help that he could give. Help us to know what we can do. Help us to not just pass by all our lives. We pray for our world. We pray for our hearts. That we would have a heart for the world like you have, God. In Jesus' name. Amen.